So today we're talking about the reading wars, a historical debate between two, arguably three ways of teaching literacy. And specifically, we're talking about the science of reading movement, a faction of the so-called reading wars. The science of reading movement is connected to other similarly named movements aimed at going back to basics and teaching, such as the science of math movement or the more general science of learning movement. The purpose of our very long and in-depth video is to demonstrate two different things. First, we want to give an overview on how the science of reading, which is steeped in this reading wars debate, is shaping our classrooms, student literacy, and teacher professional development. And we're going to talk about how this movement is not only changing reading classrooms, but the general idea of school itself. And two, we want to make the claim that the science of reading, like many of the factions that have formed around the reading wars or math wars or all these different wars, do more harm than good. And that our obsession with these labels and factions on teaching reading is dangerous and harmful to young people and teachers alike for many, many reasons. But before we talk specifically about the science of reading movement, let's take a look at this ongoing debate surrounding literacy that's been fought for nearly a hundred years. We're back now with the crisis facing America's schools. The numbers are alarming. Only about 33% of fourth graders can read proficiently. The city is launching the New York City Reads curriculum to use phonics-based methods with all students, starting with early childhood classes. What you need is the phonics. You need a really scientifically-based approach to reading instruction. So early reading instruction that aligns with the science is a code emphasis approach so that kids can get to meet. Research shows students who don't learn how to properly read are more likely to drop out of high school. The district is going back to the basics, teaching the science of reading. We have to get back to a phonics-based approach of early literacy instruction. The capital science of reading movement emerges from a decades-long debate about how literacy should be taught. It's the latest topic in the reading wars, an incredibly controversial topic that quickly descends into combative arguments if a teacher dares mention it online. Essentially, the reading wars has armies divided into two camps, phonics and whole language, which, not to be confusing, but now whole language is typically called balanced literacy, but more on that later. To understand how these two camps emerged, we need to start at one of the first major pedagogical debates in education. At the turn of the 20th century, when America was rapidly industrializing and public schools were built in huge quantities during urbanization, philosopher and founder of progressive education, John Dewey, wrote a series of papers on his concerns for public education. Essentially, he felt that schools were reducing students to cogs in a machine, that we were becoming increasingly standardized in an era of industrialization and efficiency and not producing critical thinkers. He wrote about the importance of experiential learning, where students would learn by doing, reflecting on how their daily lives connected with their experiences. At the same time, you had Edward Lee Thorndike, a theorist at Columbia University's teacher college who had a very different view of schools. Thorndike wanted to develop a science of education, lowercase, one that had a clear, objective, and standardized model that could be tinkered with over time. Thorndike developed these rating scales to standardize and measure things like drawing, spelling, and writing, and he sold immensely popular textbooks that stressed drilling basic skills and cut any content related to things like socialization, critical thinking, or other more Dewey-esque abstract concepts. His magnum opus, the Education Psychology book, outlined many of the scientific practices that shaped educational and general scientific policy across the globe even today, such as the idea of social intelligence, or what you would typically refer to today as emotional intelligence, versus so-called concrete intelligence. Dewey was fundamentally against this idea of turning education into an exact science. He believed that schools were not sterile labs and that in real life, 
Humans are complicated with multiple layers of social and political context that they find themselves in. He believed that it would be impossible to measure and tinker with people as essentially brains in jars, especially through this simplistic standardized testing model. Instead, Dewey argued that teachers must become experts at working with children, using scientific methods as sources, but recognizing that teaching is rooted in pedagogical observations and classroom experiences. He envisioned this network of educators deeply dedicated to their craft who learn from one another. This debate between Dewey and Thorndike prompted subsequent debates across a bunch of different subject areas. Long story short, as is evidenced in how probably most of us understand our own schooling experience, Professor Ellen Conliffe Langeman has argued that one cannot understand the history of education in the United States during the 20th century unless one realizes that Edward L. Thorndike won and John Dewey lost. Fast forward about 50 years or so, and once again, this argument came to the forefront in the so-called reading wars. In 1955, the book Why Johnny Can't Read exposed what was called the look-say method of teaching reading as wholly inadequate. Up until that point, most schools were teaching reading by simply pulling out picture books, pointing at words, associating the image, and then saying the whole word out loud. The book Why Johnny Can't Read stressed that phonics, or breaking down words into individual letters or groups of letters, was needed to fix literacy in schools. The phonics movement became one side of the reading wars, using a practice called decoding to use letter sounds to translate a word into speech. The phonics camp believes that this must be taught systematically and explicitly, typically in a drill-style format. Soon after, there was a new movement called Whole Language, which emerged through professors Frank Smith and Kenneth Goodman, which became the other side of the war. They saw Whole Language as a joyful and more intellectually interesting alternative to the more drill-based phonics approach. Instead of exclusively focusing on phonics, Whole Language emphasized moving away from standardized testing toward a more holistic mode of reading having students read commercially viable and interesting books, so something like Dr. Seuss, and learning through concepts like context clues. This idea became very mainstream when New Zealand educator Mary Clay found an intervention process with the philosophy of whole language called reading recovery, which took the world by storm in the 1980s and still exists today. Soon after, California adopted a new platform entirely shaped by whole language. Unlike most state initiatives, this one was unique because this program or this philosophy did not have to promote a specific scripted curriculum. And California actually barred corporate top-down curriculum models. If you were a corporation, you weren't allowed to sell in the state, at least not to every single school in the way that we traditionally think about curriculum models. Instead, they were leaning in on teacher autonomy and student interest. Whole language classrooms like those found in California were characterized by having students working freely around the room, where teachers were guides on the side that let students explore their interest. Free reading and self-directed learning were commonplace. This philosophy centered the ideas of democracy, critical thinking, and social empowerment. And corporate reading publishers began to see a lot of lost profits as a result. Standardized testing was seen as relatively unimportant in the whole language model, and California actually removed many of its state exams. This had massive implications for the commercial education industry, and this movement was going to be short-lived as a result. In the early 1990s, the yearly NAEP scores, the nation's report card, found that California ranked near the bottom of reading literacy, next to deep south states who historically really underperformed on these tests. Public sentiment was swayed to blame whole language on these results, although the full story is a, a little more complicated than that. This was exacerbated when then-Governor George W. Bush's Texas Reading Reform Initiatives were passed in the 1990s. The Texas Roundtable and the National Center for Child Health and Human Development conducted the Houston Reading Studies. The studies compared OpenCourt, which was a phonics-based program offered by McGraw-Hill, to a general whole language program, which notably this is confusing because 
even for the researchers, it was confusing. Whole language is a philosophical pedagogy. It's not a program, so it didn't have a scripted curriculum. In what could only be described at best as questionable research practices, the Houston Reading Studies proved that the direct instruction, phonics-based, open court system did a better job at teaching reading. And interestingly enough, Harold McGraw, who was the CEO of McGraw-Hill and a personal friend of George Bush, saw a record increase in profits as schools rapidly switched systems. Soon after, Bush was elected as the so-called education president and passed the Reading Excellence Act, a precursor to the No Child Left Behind Act, or NCLB. NCLB saw a multitude of phonics and direct instruction programs that capitalized on the Houston Reading Studies to make millions of dollars in schools. And alongside these changes, it was narrowly defined what literacy was. It was defined in easily measurable, rote-based topics. Essentially, it was completely counter to that philosophy of whole language just being practiced one decade earlier. This was really a death blow to the philosophy. It became widely discredited across most literacy teaching circles, and what emerged was the concept of balanced literacy. It was pitched as the methodology that incorporated both whole language and phonics. And again, to reemphasize here, typically when people, when people are talking about whole language, they're actually talking about balanced literacy and vice versa. Critics will say that they're not the same thing. Some critics will say they are the same thing. It's very confusing, but balanced literacy and whole language are, are very similar to each other. With that said, according to a 2019 survey of 600 elementary school teachers, more than two-thirds use a balanced literacy approach. Again, it's worth noting that this essentially is whole language because the folks who created whole language believed in teaching phonics. So again, like the whole language, we were doing the same thing, except they're also including phonics. However, phonics is not necessarily including the elements of whole language. Although the reading wars has lessened since the 90s, phonics proponents claim that balanced literacy does not systematize phonics enough, although in that same survey I just mentioned, it indicated that most elementary school teachers heavily prioritize phonics. They're looking at more of the phonics portion than the quote-unquote whole language portion. Most notably, balanced literacy was the focus of Emily Hanford's 2022 Sold a Story podcast from American Public Media which was an incredibly popular series that claimed that balanced literacy was an anti-science of reading, a whole language wolf in sheep's clothing coming back the, this disproven method. And the podcast focused its narrative on Lucy Calkins, a popular edu celebrity, probably most famous for establishing writer's workshops, which is a free writing program. And to an extent, Nancy Atwell, who promoted free reading and the similarly named reader's workshops. These programs were extremely popular and still are today, attracting a sizable audience and fan base at annual events like the National Council of Teachers of English. And in many ways, the same thing occurred as a decade prior with California and the Houston Reading Studies. Standardized testing results were used to blame balanced literacy, writers' workshops, readers' workshops, etc., on poor scores. And brain scientists again claimed that phonics was how people learned how to read even if that meant that teaching reading was a little bit more boring for teachers who wanted kids to be reading interesting books rather than drilling phonics. It's worth noting, as we'll talk about later, the whole language and balanced literacy movements became more centered on individuals rather than the philosophies or pedagogy itself. As the movement was initially grassroots and not as corporate as the phonics movement, it was easier for specific individuals to become the whole language and balanced literacy movement and capitalize on it. Sold a story and balanced literacy critics latched on, for example, to the three cueing method, something that whole language advocates like Ken Goodman and Mary Clay used, but Lucy Calkins was, was really well known for. She continued to popularize it until recently. In three cueing, readers would guess words based on three context clues, meaning, aka what makes sense in regards to what's going on, structure, as in what makes sense in the sentence structure, and the visual, what makes sense when you see it on the page. 
The main sticking point was that it was discouraged to phonetically sound out the words, instead opting for guessing what a word is. It is incredibly important to note that for whole language advocates, the three cueing method was never meant to be the way reading was taught. Again, whole language advocates usually believed in teaching phonics. It's whole language. But rather, this was a process of meaning making. That said, because whole language, or balanced literacy, didn't have a set curriculum, pacing guide, or a universal systematized process, the three cueing system was widely misinterpreted and misunderstood by teachers and adu celebrities alike. The result were podcasts like Sold a Story discrediting the idea entirely, which directly led to multiple states banning the method outright and abandoning balanced literacy, just like they abandoned whole language in the past. Which leads us, finally, to the rekindled reading wars of today, uh, partially in response to this kind of removal of balanced literacy, and now shifting toward the capital Science of Reading or SOR. Whereas balanced literacy attempted to meet phonics and whole language in the middle and be very clear about that, SOR doubles down on systematized phonics, drilling, and content instruction. Due to widespread reporting on the failures of balanced literacy, SOR is now widely adopted in state and district programs across the country, as well as internationally, in response to a literacy crisis driven by test scores. SOR, as documented in one of its popular supporting books, The Knowledge Gap, heralds a return to Brill-style phonics instruction, with the added element now of intensive content instruction. The Knowledge Gap traces the history of poor reading instruction to the widespread adoption of the look-say method, to the whole language method, to the balanced literacy method with a specific focus on the dangers, and we're going full circle here, of progressive education, starting with John Dewey. The knowledge gap and other science of reading-centric books point to how college education programs have mainstream progressive education as taught by John Dewey across America. And they see the widespread adoption of this idea of constructivism, which is making meaning by doing, as an attack then on direct instruction, aka mostly drills and lectures, which SOR advocates see as aligned with the science or the brain science. SOR folks believe that progressive educators see fact-focused instruction as boring and ineffective and memorization as this inherently boring and soul-destroying thing. The SOR believers counter that high-performing American charter schools, which center direct instruction, drills, etc., are more engaging than progressive education spaces. All in all, SOR-focused books center on the idea that facts and structured knowledge, as in phonics, are more important and must come first prior to higher-order thinking, like critical thinking or creativity. SOR folks literally describe whole language as the thing that wouldn't die. It's worth noting that over this entire time, in the battles between whole language, balanced literacy, phonics, and the science of reading, that test score trends have barely changed. So if we are to accept that test score data is the best way to measure reading achievement, which, you know, kind of complicated, we don't necessarily believe that, but if we take that at face value, the nation's report card has shifted from an average score of 208 to 220 from 1971 to 2020 for age 9 readers, which peaked at 215 in 1980 and 221 in 2012. Scores shifted from 255 to 260 from 1971 to 2020 for age 13 readers, peaking at 258 in 1980 259 in 1999 through 2004, and 263 in 2012. Both scores fell between 4 and 9 points in 2023 in the COVID era. A lot of numbers. But note that these national trends and test scores wax and wane without regard for which corporate curriculum package or edu celebrity ideas or philosophies are implemented. In other words, the reading wars 
don't really change much of anything on a national scale. Scores have remained relatively stagnant over time and have peaked when the supposedly contradictory ideas of whole language, phonics, and balanced literacy were claimed to be the dominant methods. The overarching battle of the reading wars could be seen, perhaps, as an ongoing debate on the purpose of education, traced back to the original forces shaping schools. Is the primary purpose of education to promote social justice, democracy, and critical thinking, as Dewey argued? Or is it to prepare a workforce-driven core knowledge curriculum as Thorndike envisioned? The arguments made through the reading wars, as well as we'll talk about later, the similar math wars and now the SEL wars, are a similar analogy for this pedagogical and political debate occurring again and again over the decades. And it impacts how we create classroom structures. If the goal of education is built around a shared cultural understanding, where core knowledge helps people assimilate into the structures of society, and as a result, workforce skills are heavily promoted, the pedagogy is going to be a lot more traditional. It's going to emphasize drills, rote memorization, more drill-based learning generally, where the teacher teaches and the students are taught. If the goal is toward more critical thought, creativity, and aspirations of democracy, the pedagogy is going to tend to be more progressive. It's going to emphasize group learning, self-directed education, and more collaborative, active, experiential learning, where teachers often learn alongside students. That would be if the debate, of course, was about that. However, we draw the conclusion that the reading wars has little to do with literacy or meaningful pedagogical debates. Instead, it serves more like a proxy war for political battles that shape the systems and structures of school akin to how conflicts throughout the Cold War resulted in so-called first world countries destabilizing and reshaping societies around the world in their image, all while weapons manufacturers and military contractors raked in huge sums of money. The, the reading words are shaped by forces primarily outside education, who either want to reshape the nature of school itself, such as through privatization or to make immense profits of school districts, or, or both of those things, Conservative actors latch onto the science of reading and phonics as a ways to promote high-achieving charter schools and voucher programs. Neoliberal actors captivate through whole language and balanced literacy to sell curriculums that claim to be magic potions for teaching literacy. This isn't to say that there aren't legitimate people or legitimate forces participating in this war, but we think that the vast majority of leading actors have vested interest beyond just teaching literacy. It's also the reason why something like Dewey's envisioned like, like utopian progressive education system has never really been practiced. This is also not to say that your typical teachers are willingly participating in these battles, because in most schools, we're going to find multifaceted elements of teaching literacy, where the goal is preparing critical thinkers who also have the core knowledge to thrive in our society, including the workforce. Most teachers simply want to find ways to teach reading to kids, and they're using what's available as a starting point, or more often than not, being forced to use very specific reading programs. This so-called war distracts teachers from being able to be professional actors in shaping students' education, and divides us from being able to find accurately researched and sound advice, all while public schools collapse around us politically and financially, under the pressure of outside forces, many of them also enlisted in, again, the reading wars. And as we'll explain shortly, the newest movement, this so-called science of reading, continues this track of harming teachers and students. And it's even more obviously a nefarious actor, having less to do with helping teachers figure out literacy and more to do with reshaping the entirety of U.S. public education. Before we talk about the big picture and what it means to teach the so-called science of reading, let's dissect what the science says. The reading wars is such a controversial issue that if we bring up the science of reading without addressing the claims behind it, we would basically be discrediting the entire video. Therefore, let's go through a few different things. The first is Reading in the Brain, the new science of how we read by Stanislas Duet a French author and neuroscientist, and an often cited book for understanding why the science of reading curriculum is needed. 
Within this work, readers are presented with a massive amount of research studies, diagrams, charts, facts, and figures about the specific brain patterns and functions that demonstrate when we literally read pages from a book. It's a fascinating deep dive into neuroscience. In one of the chapters, Duen leans into the reading wars, commenting at length on whole language and balanced literacy, countering with a number of points on why these methods don't work. However, it can be very dangerous to focus on a very specific lens of scientific study, especially when you don't consider how it's implemented. Our understanding of literacy can't solely rely on specific elements of neuroscience as presented by Duen, especially when we consider that there are even more differences between different takes on the different studies of the brain itself. Cognition is not simply a brain event. Schooling doesn't happen to brains separate from bodies, culture, or purpose, nor is it separate from the full experience of just being human. If we recognize and believe that cognition is not simply a brain event and schooling happens to fully embody people, it's really just not that useful to draw this box around a specific examination of cognitive science and then call that the science of learning. This isn't to suggest that there isn't a benefit, again, to neuroscience, nor that we shouldn't invest in studies such as those featured in Reading in the Brain. This isn't also to debate research that suggests certain practices have improved outcomes. But we must recognize that the dynamic nature of learning environments, that there's just too many variables to isolate one incredibly specific way to learn anything such as our limitations in how maybe neurodivergent students experience so-called evidence-based practices, or in the varying contexts and school communities that this research may be applied on students. Again, to emphasize, the science of reading movement is the idea of systematizing phonics through mostly uh, drill-based, memor memorization-based, uh, repetitious-based instruction model that may not work for all students. That brings us to Ivan Pavlov and who are perfect examples of why this idea of just following the research can prove problematic. When we look at, for example, Pavlov's experiments in classical conditioning, it's framed in textbooks as dogs who become conditioned to salivate at the ringing of a bell. Most people, though, are not familiar with how Pavlov made that experiment work. This is sadly very gross and a very inhumane story. Please note, skip ahead to the time scamp on screen to avoid this description because it's uh, animal cruelty. As writer Michael Spector describes, Pavlov would remove a dog's esophagus and create an opening, a fistula, in the animal's throat so that no matter how much the dog ate, the food would fall out and never make it to the stomach. By creating additional fistulas along the digestive system and collecting the various secretions, he could measure their quality and chemical properties in great detail. Experiments like this highlight why neuroscience and psychological experiments, which occur in lab-like settings, are not one-to-one -one applicable with classroom spaces. Our students are not surgically modified dogs. We know from hundreds of focus groups that our organization conducts with young people, as well as an ample research base, that there's a persistent crisis in schools long before COVID. Students are asking fewer questions the longer that they remain in school. Engagement plummets alongside mental health, especially in middle school and onward. And absenteeism is surging. Our fidelity, let's say, to Pavlov's lab results matters significantly less if the practices derived from his work are contributing to stress, harm, and the dehumanization of students. If the perfect education system requires that you dehumanize the people in it, adults and kids alike, that's not a system that works by most metrics worth caring about. The kids in our schools have to be viewed as more than lab subjects to implement ideas on. If we start with this thought process, then the act of teaching gets a lot more complicated. Converting scientific findings into successful classroom strategies requires deep and nuanced understandings of both the science, but also its real-world implications. Educators must be prepared, trained, and supported in recognizing the nuances of science and learning. And we can't do that 
if the debate simply lives at this label of what learning is or how literacy works or whatever curriculum package is being sold at the time. People on all sides of the reading wars have popularized voices that represent their collective movements who often divide people into teams that simply cheer on their ideology and badmouth those that are against them. This isn't to say that people shouldn't be critical of each other. After all, that's quite literally what we're doing right now in many ways. Nor that we should take some moral high ground by saying that everyone should get along. It's saying that there is a highly problematic trend of forming teams and pitting people against each other with the clear goal, really, of selling a curriculum, selling workshops, simply making a lot of money, instead of having a nuanced conversation about teaching literacy. Both science of reading and balanced literacy figureheads have formed these click-like groups that serve more harm than good. I mentioned her briefly earlier, but probably most contentious is Lucy Calkins, one of the founders of the Writing Workshop and fairly well-known edu celebrity. Recently, Calkins endorsed a more phonics-based and science of reading approach to literacy, but she was previously known as like the bastion defender of balanced literacy instruction. So while intended or not, Calkins has garnered significant attention at conferences and in schools by having this almost uh, guru-like persona, leading many supporters to simply endorse everything that she says or hate on those who disagree with her methods. Meanwhile, it seems like Calkins is primarily concerned with following methods and programming that keeps her audience as large as possible and engaged, and in our view, it just seems like she's, I don't know, simply following the money. The reason we say this isn't to specifically hate on Lucy Calkins. We don't have anything specifically against Lucy Calkins. But we do recognize that Edu celebrity culture within the reading wars, as well as these specific camps that have been built around celebrities in the science of reading movement, and the various publishers and curriculum packages, distract from any meaningful conversation about teaching literacy. And these leading voices who make blanket assumptions about the other side, whether that be balanced literacy or the science of reading or whatever it might be, don't actually help kids learn reading and writing. To say that neuroscientists have already figured out a science of reading, or that there's only one hyper-specific marketed way toward teaching any type of literacy, is dangerous. To claim that new evidence is pulling us astray, or to say that conversations critical of these methods are harming kids, we should call that out for what it is. That's an ideological movement, not a science of learning. That said, having a critical conversation about the science of reading allows us to share plenty of examples of how science of reading advocates reference inaccurate, misinterpreted, and problematic studies to support claims about how we should teach literacy, and why it is that the science of reading movement is so connected to grander narratives about how schools should look and whose children should have the most rigorous implementation of these studies. So here we go. I think this is the part where it's going to start getting controversial. There are two studies that come up time and time again within the science of reading circles, especially in more conservative areas, the so-called baseball study and word gap study. The baseball study refers to a 1988 article called Effect of Prior Knowledge on Good and Poor Readers, Memory of Text. The researchers conducted a study where students are divided into four groups determined by their reading ability and knowledge of baseball. Groups were distributed based on their relative understanding of both, as in having a high reading ability and a high knowledge of baseball, or a low reading ability and a high knowledge of baseball, etc. etc. Students were tasked to read a narrative text that talked about a half inning in a baseball game. Then students used a wooden model of a baseball field to simulate what they read and verbally describe what was happening. Then, after some time, students were asked to summarize what happened and rank the most important ideas in the text. Each time, regardless of their reading ability, the students who had the most knowledge of baseball performed better. The researchers concluded that curriculum designers must recognize that content knowledge is, at minimum, equally valuable to reading instruction. This became an integral part of the science of reading curriculum, recognizing the importance of core knowledge. The thinking goes that if you simply provide a set of low-performing students enough core knowledge, then they will have a better chance of being literate. 
For many conservative, more authoritarian actors, the baseball study demonstrates that the teacher determines what should be taught and what information is important. Then that information is relayed to students, that teachers teach and the students learn and that the students don't have anything to contribute from their own background knowledge. The teacher is the one who determines what's important. Many in this camp follow the teachings of E.D. Hirsch, a prominent education theorist and chairperson of the Core Knowledge Foundation, who is often linked to the science of reading movement. His most influential work, Cultural Literacy, outlines around 5,000 different names, phrases, dates, and concepts that, quote, every American should know to be, quote, culturally literate. Especially back in the 80s and 90s, this book, which inspired the standards movement in American education, was highly contested since we have to determine, okay, what is core knowledge? Should all kids learn about baseball? Is that core knowledge? What does it mean to be, quote, culturally literate? Edie Hirsch and Associates created a series of books for different grade levels, such as what your sixth grader needs to know, and outline specific standards to cover at each grade level. This mirrors a lot of common educational practice and how we structure curriculums now. This becomes problematic when we consider what narratives and backgrounds and contexts shape these curriculums and what we deem as important, especially as we have competing interests deciding what is and is not important for young people of different backgrounds. For example, the updated book by Hirsch, the New Dictionary of Cultural Literacy, What Every American Needs to Know, which was published in 2002, literally opens on page one, stating that everyone needs to know the Bible. They write, no one in the English-speaking world can be considered literate without a basic knowledge of the Bible. Hirsch and his co-authors acknowledge that learning about all major religions at a basic level is important, but that, quote, the logical conclusion is that our schools need to teach more about the Bible than about the Quran, but they have a responsibility to teach about both. Far from being illegal or undesirable, teaching about the Bible is not only consistent with our constitution, it is essential to our literacy. The book then outlines a series of concepts and definitions that all people should learn, including concepts like Abraham and Isaac, Apocrypha, Ararat, Antichrist, Damascus, Ecclesiates, the phrase, get thee behind me, Satan, and many more. To fully understand the core knowledge that Hirsch and his followers call for, it's worth noting just how many of these concepts that you, the viewer, and us for that matter, likely don't know, or just how ridiculous some of these concepts are that every American should know. Them. For example, here's a short list of words from the 669 page, The New Dictionary of Cultural Literacy beyond the first chapter on the Bible. The idiom, how many angels can stand or dance on the head of a pin. The Italian author, Giovanni Jacopo Casanova. The concept of Zeno's paradox. The poem, Casey at the Bat. The sonnet by William Wordsworth, The World is Too Much With Us. Intransitive verbs. The operatic series, Ring of the Nibelung. The Italian politician, Lucrezia Borgia. The naval battle, Monitor versus Merrimack. The study of parapsychology. Parody price. Parkinson's law. Therapeutic cloning. Peaker plants, or even pederas, but that's literally in the book. FYI. Of course, you might be wondering, or maybe you already know what some of these things are, and you may be curious to learn more about them. And of course, there are some fairly normal, typical things in this book that you would typically learn in school. For example, they talk about what a poem is or what the concept of rhythm is. But I, I can't highlight enough, and it's worth noting, that these aren't cherry-picked ideas. We genuinely didn't know a vast number of things in this book, despite both being college educated, feeling like relatively successful, productive people, human beings. It's really no different than asking ChatGPT to generate a list of the 10 top most important books. The list you get will vary a lot depending on the question you ask, 
and whose perspective and culture you center in the prompt. Any single list of core knowledge or cultural literacy is going to be up for debate. The point isn't that we can't be curious about learning new things or that there aren't a lot of things we will learn in school, but that this idea that a group of people, especially those with systemic power, mostly white Christian males, deciding what everyone should know is quite ludicrous. We also must consider how many concepts that might matter to you and your community that may be left out of a book like this and could perhaps be taught in school that would make a difference in navigating your communities, and how further these ideas are going to be malleable and flexible for any given learning community at any given time. Many in the science of reading movement read the baseball study as a simple fact. Get all kids to know the same core knowledge. Have the teacher go back to basics and teach basic facts to everyone and move away from any distractions. This means to lean away from curriculum that incorporates social justice or culturally relevant pedagogy. In fact, many of these authors and advocates often call their detractors anti-science because they feel like these people are ignoring the science or not following concepts like the aforementioned baseball study. Of course, no one is saying that background knowledge isn't important. It's just a much bigger conversation than teach everyone baseball. Another often cited study is the word gap study, a questionably researched and discredited idea that has been cited over 8,000 times. Published in Meaningful Differences in the Everyday Experience of Young American Children in 1995, the study follows families from lower income and higher income families, which notably in the study are labeled as welfare and professional families. The majority of lower income families were black and the majority of higher income families were white. The study claimed that families living in poverty heard 30 million fewer words by age three. This study was discredited for a variety of reasons, from how data was collected to racist interpretations of cultural and dialect differences to an, the, the very small sample size. It has been replicated, though, to perhaps potentially show 4 million words in difference. Or it's been reinterpreted sometimes to this idea of turn-taking or conversational turns, the conversations that children are having with their families back and forth. We spoke to Dr. Megan Figueroa, a research scientist in the Tweedy Language Development Lab in the Department of Psychology at the University of Arizona to learn more. I, I brought this quote um, from Hart and Reasley's book, which I recently revisited. It's horrible to revisit. It's hard for me. It's a terrible study. But what they're doing is they, they motivate their research as a call to action in the war on poverty. I don't know if you know this. Um, and the war on poverty is the unofficial name for legislation by the U.S. government to lessen poverty. It's, it's, um, you know, terrible effects, all of this. Um, so early intervention programs were one manifestation of this era. And um, so Hart and Reasley were working with an intervention program for preschool aged black children who came from poor homes. And they, their job was to intervene upon these children's everyday language to better prepare them for to succeed in school. However, the researchers could not find anything wrong with the children's language. And they say, quote, the children seemed fully competent to us, well able to explain and elaborate the topics typical in preschool interactions. We became increasingly uncertain about which language skills we should be undertaking to improve. So at this point, you would be like, <laughs> let's walk away from this. Like, let's, there's nothing to improve here. Like, right. Um, but instead, they're going to say, well, quote, we need to know not from our textbooks, but from advantaged children, what skilled spontaneous speech at age four is in terms of grammar and content. So they made this decision to compare the black children's language to the quote unquote skilled language of quote unquote advantaged children. Studies like the word gap, like the achievement gap, often promote deficit thinking about individuals and families and often place blame on the wrong parties or harbor really racist interpretations about teaching and learning. Instead of looking at systemic barriers in education, such as how eliminating poverty is a political choice and would have massive implications for literacy, attention is turned to how families in precarious situations are somehow responsible for illiteracy. It puts the onus on the individual. This line of thinking becomes readily apparent in The Knowledge Gap, the hidden cause of America's education crisis by Natalie Wexler and an often cited member in the Science of Reading community. We're going to be talking about this book for quite a while. It was also mentioned earlier as one of the popularizers of the Science of Reading movement. 
we asked again Dr. Figueroa about a specific section of this book that talks about these studies. To quote Wexler at length in the book, less educated parents are also less likely to use complex vocabulary in conversation, and teachers may not be exposing students to it either. One study found that children living in high poverty neighborhoods get, quote, a double dose of disadvantage as opposed to their higher income peers. The language they hear is less sophisticated both at home and at school. While these children, quote, may have unique linguistic strengths that serve them well in their immediate settings, they were less likely to have the language skills that would enable them to do well academically. Whatever the causes, it's clear that children with certain risk factors begin school with skills that may be almost a year behind those of their peers, and the gap only widens with time. The more knowledge a child starts with, the more likely she is to acquire yet more knowledge. She'll read more and understand and retain information better because knowledge, like Velcro, sticks best to other related knowledge. This phenomenon of snowballing knowledge accumulation by kids who start off with more, while those who start off with less require less, has been dubbed the Matthew effect. That's a reference to a line in the gospel according to Matthew. Quote, For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Or, quote, The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And the longer the Matthew effect is allowed to continue, the harder it is to reverse. That's why it's crucial to envelop students from less educated families in a knowledge-building environment as early as possible. Rather than being restricted to the simple material that they can read on their own, young children need to listen to their teachers, read more complex books aloud, and engage in discussions about what they've heard. And, depending on their age, write about it. Even many middle schoolers can take in far more sophisticated content and the vocabulary that goes with it through listening and speaking than through their own reading. What? I feel like she talked about like the God effect or something of like the school systems because it, the Matthew effect, I can't believe that this biblical reference that is not shocking. Um, <laughs> no. So, okay. Uh, my mind is reeling, but um, we reward certain behaviors in schools. So when we talk about complex vocabulary, I think about all the kids that know just from their environments, vocabulary that isn't rewarded in schools. And um, so like, I think of, you know, what if your dad is, um, is a mechanics and you know, like where it's like soldering iron, you know, by the time I was five years old, I had two definitions for the word scab because I was a union kid. So like, mm, you're not gonna reward that in school. So this idea that they come to school unprepared or less prepared is only because we reward a certain knowledge. It's an um, epistemological thing. We're only rewarding one type of knowledge when these kids get to school. And that is reflected in the vocabulary because vocabulary is very socially dependent. We learn the words that are around us and that are important for us. Um, and it's not of the mind. So it's not that because we have, you know, some kids have the words for like yacht or, or, you know, like all these words that you might find in in children's books, if you haven't come across them yet, um, having these words doesn't make the child um, any better prepared in the only way that they would be better prepared is if we're rewarding those vocabulary items um, socially. So there's nothing that has to do with it cognitively making them better. Of course, science of reading advocates are not going to solely rest their claims on the baseball study or the word gap study, nor are they going to reference learning in the brain or the knowledge gap at every single point, although many do, and that's why we're talking about it. But it is important to talk about this because the science of reading movement is a political movement. Sure, there's a pedagogical discussion to be had, but the way that we decide how we teach, what we learn, who is valued and not valued, and ultimately what kids learn at school and do at school is through policy. It's directly determined by political actors and those influenced by social and cultural contexts. All education is political. And these studies inform certain problematic political leanings that negatively impact young people and have very scary implications for the future of learning more broadly. The Knowledge Gap book is a fascinating case study in the political leanings of the science of reading movement. Natalie Wexner frequently hosts webinars about the science of reading 
Her book is tied to the top books to understand SOR. And The Knowledge Gap is one of the top selling and recently released books on teaching and learning literacy. However, the book isn't an overview of brain image scans or really specific research studies. The vast majority of the book is actually highlighting well known conservative and highly divisive school leaders and personalities who aim to transform schools around the world. In this way, the science of reading seems less about science and more about this ideology. Here's a few interesting um, folks who essentially have chapters framed around them in the knowledge gap. First off, we have Doug Lamov. Lamov is the author of the Teach Like a Champion series, a list of teaching techniques that demand high expectations from all learners. It's one of the best-selling education books of all time, and chances are, if you're a teacher, you've been given this book, or at minimum, you've seen it predominantly displayed at a Barnes & Noble or something. Teach Like a Champion is a global phenomenon and is tied to Doug Lamal's founding of the Uncommon Schools Network, which is a nonprofit public K-12 charter school system found across Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York. Although many of the techniques that this book implies are fine, Lamov's often been rightfully criticized for highly controlling and having questionable practices toward young people. Probably most contentious is his acronym SLANT, sit up, listen, ask and answer questions, nod your head, track the speaker, which gives the appearance of engagement and often leads to tightly controlled spaces where students get in trouble for not having the right body positioning or way of engagement. Lamov has been criticized by a variety of educators and researchers for how his work is carried out, highlighting how it impacts students of color, neurodiverse learners, and general engagement in student well-being. The rigorous implementation of Teach Like a Champion practices are typically found in so-called no-excuses charter schools, where primarily white teachers teach primarily students of color and ignored and economically impoverished communities. Mirroring the conclusions of the baseball study and word gap studies, the idea is that students are subjected to intense, highly controlled environments to prepare them for the real world and provide a harsh but needed educational environment. In practice, this is what it looks like. And hands up. Shake them out. One, hands down. Stand one. Turn. Come to the carpets, those dollars. We have been reading each day this week the biggest house in the world. And our focus the other day is raising a hand. What has our focus been as we've read this book? We've been Okay, I'm a square field with an area of 169 square feet. What's the length of one of my sides, Jenna? Here's another great teacher cold calling. This is Jesse Rector. Excellent. I'm a square field with a perimeter of 48 feet. What's my area? Katrina. Jesse's kids are all standing. When he asks them to stand, they know they're going to get cold called. Cold call is better when the students know it's coming. That way they're all doing every problem in their heads to be ready. And they're hard problems. Excellent. Uh, I am a tri an isosceles triangle, excuse me, with two angles that measure 3x each. What is the measure of my third angle, Anaya? Um, 180 degrees minus 3x. Excellent. 180 Remember, and second of all, some of them, especially down here, are not as simple as they seem at first glance. And this is the sort of thing. This is the sort of thing where um, if you don't know how to do this, you actually don't know how to speak English completely. I'm not trying to take you back to middle school. I know you're about to go to college. But what I'm saying is, look up here. What I'm saying is that if you don't know this going into college, you sound like you're still in middle school. As you probably see, these spaces aren't particularly concerned with how students experience them as long as the script is faithfully followed. They don't embody joy or care or love and engagement. In fact, it isn't even apparent that these environments work. In spite of essentially turning these students into an experiment as you'd see from B.S. Skinner or Pavlov. Although Uncommon Schools claim to have high college graduation rates, and they probably do, there are numerous horror stories of how these schools treat young people and educators alike, and there have been frequent reports of how dangerous Teach Like a Champion practices can be on young people's social and emotional health. 
nor is it clear if any of these practices are even that productive or useful for teaching. In recent years, this has been highly evident as the newest version of Teach Like a Champion has distanced itself from a lot of these practices, such as changing SLANT, the acronym, to STAR. And Uncommon Schools no longer officially endorses or is connected to the Teach Like a Champion technique package because of a variety of different concerns on how students were treated. Lamov, quite literally, is the first person we see in Wexler's Science of Reading book. He writes the testimonial. An ensuing chapter praises Doug Lamov's implementation of phonics and reading skills. Wexler laments charter schools who focus on these dangerous progressive education methods like critical thinking. Uh, overwhelming uh, critique you'll find by conservative commentators is that the vast majority of colleges across the states have made teachers into these progressive ideologues who only care about critical thinking and creativity and not about core content knowledge. She writes on how Lamov is a success story and reconsidering how we teach this content knowledge, facts, and, and literacy. Next is Daniel Willingham, a cognitive psychologist and author of the best-selling book, Why Don't Students Like School? Willingham is a huge proponent of instilling content knowledge, and Wexler ties his ideas to the baseball study as to why students must memorize facts. Again, criticizing theories in progressive education, she writes, quote, The prevailing theory is that students must engage in constructing their own knowledge rather than memorizing facts that will only bore them and that they don't truly understand. Teachers are also taught that education should be child-centered, a term that generally means learning should be driven as much as possible by the interests of the individual child, with the teacher acting as a facilitator rather than by a curriculum. Daniel Willingham and other cognitive scientists point out that many of these theories have long been discredited. Daniel Willingham is an interesting figure because although many conservative actors utilize his ideas, he doesn't necessarily endorse them. For example, many conservative educators in the direct instruction camp, those who believe that all students should be systematically taught through lectures, quizzes, and rote memorization, often cite Willingham, even though Willingham has explicitly said that he doesn't associate with this idea of pure direct instruction. Willingham tiptoes around and unacknowledges the politics of education that lead to this very conservative interpretation of the future of school. By choosing not to take stances around these really specific interpretations of teaching and learning, he leaves open the door to conservative actors implementing problematic ideas as expressed through the baseball study. Kind of like maybe perhaps the, uh, the Tim Pool of educational psychology. I think that this is probably best expressed by Willingham himself as he wrote in a 2013 blog post, quote, which of these learning situations strikes you as the most natural, the most authentic? One, a child learns to play a video game by exploring it on his own. Two, a child learns to play a video game by watching a more experienced player. Three, a child learns to play a video game by being taught by a more experienced player. In my experience, a lot of people take the first of these scenarios to be the most natural type of learning we explore on our own. The third scenario has its place, but direct instruction from someone is a bit contrived compared to our own experience. I've never really agreed with this point of view simply because I don't much care about naturalness one way or the other. As long as learning is happening, I'm happy, and I think the value some people place on naturalness is a hangover from the bygone romantic era. Or in other words, uh, Willingham says that people who play video games and learn how to play video games by playing them, even though that's the most natural way, and that probably makes the most sense, is not the way that he thinks that we should even be talking about it. Instead, you can learn through any of those ways. You no, know, that's kind of a, a, a ludicrous idea. Then again, we have E.D. Hirsch, as we were talking about earlier, in terms of cultural literacy. Wexler celebrates his core knowledge books and the core knowledge sequence, which are the standards based on the ideas through the core knowledge foundation. A curriculum was built on these standards, which is used in some charter school networks, which again celebrates this idea of content knowledge as the objective of a means toward more literacy. Next, we have David Coleman, the president of the college board, the people who create and serve AP tests in the SAT, who is a former McKinsey and company consultant and probably best known as the architect of the Common Core standards. Interestingly enough, Although the Common Core is often lambasted by conservative actors as this federal control on schools, 
The basis of Common Core is heavily connected to E.D. Hirsch. When Common Core was being conceptualized in the late 2000s, the Core Knowledge Foundation released a statement called Voluntary National Standard Dead on Arrival, which said that the skills-focused curriculum, which included very little specific content knowledge, would do nothing to actually improve schools. Wexler writes that the Common Core had useful skills, such as citing evidence from text, but didn't include which text should be read, something that Core Knowledge folks were very critical of. Although Coleman likely isn't accepted by the other people that we're naming on this list, Wexler implies that Coleman had some good ideas that were just improperly implemented. Speaking of the Core Knowledge Foundation, that letter to David Coleman was written not by E.D. Hirsch, but by the senior fellow at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, Robert Pondicio. Pondicio is the author of How the Other Half Learns, who is a firm believer in the core knowledge curriculum and the science of reading movement, and who, like everyone else on this list, is celebrated by Wexler. Pondicio focuses his work on explicit instruction, scripted curriculums, and a very, what we could maybe call an old school view of education. Pondicio endorsed the Common Core after the knowledge building curriculum component was added into it after his letter and frequent discussions with Coleman. He has a very specific angle on what he feels like are the potential reasons schools should shift back to core knowledge, which includes takes like stating that DEI has gone too far, believing that transgender athletes are endangering women's sports, not believing that young people can choose sexual identities, he also generally believes that young people cannot have serious opinions. And finally, we have Catherine Burbelson, often referred to by her Twitter or X name, Miss Snuffy, founder and head of the Michaela Community School in London. Michaela is called Britain's strictest school, and Time Magazine profiled the school in 2018, writing, Demerits are given out for the slightest errors, for getting a pen, slouching, turning to look out of a window during a lesson, Two demerits in a class equals a detention. That's another demerit. You're too disorganized, an English teacher tells one girl who struggled to find her textbook in the allocated 10 seconds. They talk about how the school is run with military precision, and digital clocks fill every room for specific timings. Students walk in silence on black lines that have been run down hallways. Teachers look on to reprimand students who make sound or are moving too slowly. Mirrors aren't present in the bathroom so that students are not distracted. Students are taught that the strictness is good for them, and they incorporate many of Lamaze teachings with teachers yelling slant for students to track them and follow them with their eyes. The school focuses on rote memorization and repetition. It's worth noting that for a while, some people online had edited the Google Maps link to the school as the Michaela Community Prison. According to the piece, students appreciate the strictness and feel it's done out of care, and that the quality of the education is recognized as outstanding. Despite the fact that at one point she served as the UK chair of the Social Mobility Commission, a position that she was appointed to by the shortest serving UK prime minister and leader of the Conservative Party, Liz Truss, and despite the fact that she appeals to attendees at the NatCon UK, do you love your children enough to change them to a less woke school? Miss Snuffy labels herself as a small C conservative. Verbal Singh has spread vicious anti-trans and anti-queer rumors about students identifying as cats, litter boxes in schools, and also bragged on social media about Jordan Peterson's visit to the school in September 2022. It is a remarkable coincidence that the objective or science-based science of learning or science reading curriculum happens to support the social, cultural, political, and educational vision of conservative reactionaries. For all of these actors who frequently engage with each other online, there are common political takes. They all support the dismantling of public education through vouchers and other so-called school choice programs. They support a very particular narrow reactionary view of so-called parents' rights. They criticize progressive education and especially believe that progressive education is this widespread educational practice in schools that everyone's following. And please note that's not the case. Uh, progressive education is actually very rare. They have a general anti-DEI lens, which includes transphobia and concerns about quote unquote woke culture. There are a few other minor names throughout Wexler's work, but a common theme remains clear. One of the most influential books in the science of reading movement is highly political. 
we can't separate the ideas of just teaching facts or core knowledge or literacy without recognizing the voices propping up this movement are building silent corridor schools, schools frequently lambasted as carceral spaces that are dangerous to students, especially students of color, and by those who frequently attack the representation and bodily autonomy of LGBTQIA plus students. The conservative Thomas B. Fordham Institute easily fits the science of reading into their broader mission to provide state funding for private education under the alias of school choice. The future of education as envisioned by these actors in our view is horrific. Imagine if typical schools looked more like Lamovs or Miss Snuffies. And finally, it also gives away the game that the science of reading is officially endorsed by Moms for Liberty, a conservative political organization labeled by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a far-right extremist organization. Moms for Liberty endorses things like book banning. They call in complaints about teaching divisive concepts, including about MLK Jr. and civil rights issues. They have threatened school librarians who have brought in books about race and LGBTQIA plus issues. Members of their organization have said horrific things, especially targeted towards students of color, LGBT students, neurodiverse students, and many students at the margins. Some members of the science of reading community have attempted to distance themselves from Moms for Liberty by stating that they're just concerned moms or that there's this grassroots organization, but that just isn't anywhere close to accurate. Moms for Liberty is directly funded by conservative actors, attracting sponsors such as the Right Wing Heritage Foundation. The organization was co-founded by Bridget Ziegler, wife of Republican Christian Ziegler, or Ziegler? I don't know, it doesn't matter who are well-known friends of Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump. Bridget and her husband are closely associated with the Hollow 2A, a controversial, um, I guess you would call it an event space, that is associated with the Proud Boys and other people involved with the January 6th insurrection, as well as raising questionable, intense viewpoints on assault rifles, mask mandates, and other conservative issues. Campaigns for Bridget Ziegler's school board candidacy were held here. Christian Ziegler has been accused of sexual assault allegations, which he claims was a sexual relationship involving himself, his wife, and the accuser. It's worth noting that Bridget is no longer formally part of Mom's Liberty, but this is one of the people that helped found it. The other two co-founders, Tina Deskovic and Tiffany Justice, are also conservative political activists. Deskovich and Justice are both former school board members who claim that Moms for Liberty is not a conservative organization, regardless that the fact the founding of the organization was explicitly against school closures and mask mandates in classrooms. They claim that the designation of their organization as an extremist organization is inaccurate. However, even a shallow look at the messaging that Moms for Liberty advocates center in their messages at school board and online will demonstrate their viewpoints especially on LGBTQ students and students of color. While some science of reading advocates have distanced themselves again from Moms for Liberty, most have remained silent or even cheered it on. Ryan Walters, Oklahoma's reactionary state superintendent, has embraced state investment in the science of reading, while at the same time calling the teachers' union a terrorist organization and vowing to, quote, bring God and prayer back in schools in Oklahoma and fight back against the radical myth of separation of church and state. Walters has also pledged a revision of Oklahoma's American history and civics curriculum that includes PragerU and Hillsdale College as possible vendors. In the last year, the largest school district in Texas, Houston ISD, has shifted to a view of education much in line with everything that we've spoken about here. Superintendent Mike Miles has mandated a science of reading curriculum that can be taught in English only saying, quote, you cannot read well if you can't decode, and you cannot decode if you don't do it in English. So we're going to do the science of reading, decoding, and language comprehension in English, and then we will supplement the language Spanish. Now, neither Texas nor the United States have an official language, and according to district figures, 62% of HISD students are Hispanic and Latino, and 42% are Spanish-speaking. As linguist Noam Chomsky says, Questions of language are basically questions of power. And therefore, these questions about teaching literacy and the reading wars broadly have little to do with actually teaching literacy. As we mentioned earlier in this video, this battle is a proxy war where students and teachers are being actively harmed. Engaging in these battles 
has nothing truly to do with helping cultivate literate kids. It has more to do with political, social, and cultural battles tearing apart our schools. Therefore, it isn't that the research is literally political or that we should stop doing brain science because of how some people are interpreting and applying this data. Instead, it's recognizing that the way the reading wars is being fought by large actors is harming young people and educators through these political wars. If we're not critical about the science of reading, we are endorsing the so-called superpowers that are guiding this discussion and putting us into a situation where we are pseudo-endorsing many dangerous people who are looking to co-opt a narrow view of research as a doctrine toward transforming schools. The science of reading gained widespread popularity with the influential podcast Sold a Story from American Public Media. Hosted by journalist Emily Hanford, Sold a Story is a podcast that investigates the ongoing reading wars between phonics, whole language, balanced literacy, and the so-called science of reading. Throughout the series, listeners hear from teachers who felt betrayed by what school leaders, education celebrities, and publishers told them was the right way to teach, only to later learn that they had been teaching in ways deemed ineffective. Sold a Story is highly celebrated by many of the folks we just mentioned, such as Robert Pondicio. Throughout these stories, it becomes clear that teachers did their jobs to the best of their personal ability in exactly the ways that were incentivized by the system itself. Many of the approaches that were criticized in the series offered teachers a sense of aspirational community, it gave them opportunities for teaching and professional development, and it gave them the prestige of working with Ivy League researchers. Further, they came with real material assets. They came with massive classroom libraries and flexible seating options for students that did transform their classroom spaces. Teachers taught how they were instructed to teach using the resources that they were required to use. They didn't have a critical toolkit and systemic support to evaluate the claims of effectiveness of these programs, and they lacked the collective power to challenge the dictates of these million-dollar curriculum packages that were being forced upon them. And given the lack of educational resources at the disposal of most individual teachers, it's easy to see why they embrace such a visible investment in reading instruction. Throughout, Emily Hanford, the host, frames teachers who participated in these new methods, these whole language or balanced literacy methods, as having willingly bought into a cult of personality, infatuated with various leaders like Lucy Calkins and the whole language movement. A key objective of the Soul to Story podcast was to communicate to listeners that the science of reading is the only valid evidence-based way to teach kids to read and borders on calling other approaches a form of educational malpractice. After the podcast aired, the science of reading itself has become, ironically, a marketed political label that people are buying and kind of forcing onto people, the same thing that Emily Hamper was criticizing about many balanced of reading curriculums. States and cities have passed laws requiring the science of reading, sending school leaders scrambling to purchase new programs and train teachers to comply with these new policies. For example, in May 2023, the mayor of New York City announced a tectonic shift in reading instruction for New York City schools. The change required school leaders to choose from one of three pre-approved curriculum packages provided by three different publishing companies. New York City schools also disbanded their in-house literacy coaching program over the summer to contract instead with outside companies to provide coaching. It's hard not to conclude that the same publishing ecosystem that sold school leaders and policy makers on the previous evidence-based reading curriculum and that Hanford condemns in the podcast, the balanced literacy stuff, is also happy to meet their current needs in the marketplace now with the science of reading movement. Meet the, the new boss the same as the old boss. The chaotic back and forth was also recognized by many veteran teachers responding to the chalkbeat piece on social media. One education and literacy coach commented, I sometimes wonder how many curriculum variations I've seen in the last three decades. Here, teachers, drops off box curriculum, now teach this way. Cognitive scientist and psycholinguist Mark Seidenberg wrote a foundational science of reading text, Language at the Speed of Sight, How We Read, Why So Many Can't, and What Can Be Done About It. Now, Mark is someone who would probably disagree with us pedagogically, but it's someone that we have learned from a lot. Apparently, he feels a similar 
oddness with the science of reading label and what it represents. He writes, I'm going to lay my cards on the table here. The treatment of phonetic awareness and the science of reading, the idea that a certain level of phonetic awareness is prerequisite for reading, and that phonetic awareness training should continue until the student becomes highly proficient at phonetic awareness tasks, regardless of how well they are reading, is emblematic of problems that have arisen within the science of reading approach. It is an overprescription that reflects a shallow understanding of reading development, yet has become a major tenet of the science of reading. The phonetic awareness situation and other developments suggest to me that the science of reading is at risk of turning into a new pedagogical dogma, consisting of a small set of tenets loosely tied to some classic but dated research, supplemented by additional assumptions that are ad hoc and ill-advised. Seidenberg has come under criticism in recent weeks due to doubling down on his issues with his hyper-narrow look at the science of reading which, as we've shown again and again, seems to be more political and ideological than actually rooted in teaching literacy. That said, what does happen if we look at previous efforts to scale up a science of reading phonics-style curriculum? A massive study of the $6 billion No Child Left Behind era Reading First program, a program that was based on phonics, found that while improvements in decoding followed from an increase in explicit phonics instruction, these improvements and investments showed, on average across the study sites, estimated impacts on student reading test scores were not statistically significant. Worse yet, another study of Reading First found that reading scores declined as much as 50%, where culturally responsive practices and bilingual whole language models were replaced by mandated English-only phonics instruction for a Navajo Nation school. In other words, when we shifted away from a whole language balanced literary literacy more holistic perspective towards a mandated drill-style English-only system, especially at a Navajo Nation school, of course, test scores plummeted, and I'm going to assume that interest and engagement did as well. Another study looked at the impact of language essentials for the teachers of reading and spelling, or L-E-T-R-S, training on teaching practice and student engagement across 90 schools and 24,000 students. One teacher group received 48 hours of professional development in the system. Another teacher group received an additional 60 hours of on-site coaching. The study found that teacher knowledge and implementation of the scientifically-based reading instruction method, this phonics-based method, again showed no improvements on student reading achievement. Although there were positive impacts on teachers' knowledge of the scientifically-based research instruction, and on one of the three instructional practices promoted by the study PD, neither PD intervention resulted in significantly higher student test scores at the end of this one-year treatment. Or in other words, it doesn't seem like the science of reading or phonics-based instruction methods are actually leading to increased test scores. Still, another study examined the effectiveness of McGraw-Hill's phonics-based K-6 open court reading program. This was the program mentioned earlier that mainstreamed the phonics movement in the United States and undermined the whole language movement. It claims on its website to be underpinned by findings from learning theory and cognitive science, also known as the science of reading, and proven to achieve reading gains in a diverse range of readers from beginning to fluent. Open court reading is research validated as well as research based. In this case, even though open court reading is kind of the thing that popularized phonics. It also is latching onto that science of reading label. Um, in many ways, they are one and the same. If whole language is balanced literacy, phonics is science of reading. They are incredibly similar to each other in terms of how um, kind of their camps have gone into place in this war. In findings from a multi-year scale-up effectiveness trial of open court reading, which involved 9,000 students and 2,000 teachers from 49 different elementary schools, Researchers found no statistically significant main effects on students' reading performance in year one and a small negative effect in year two, concluding, relative to the business-as-usual reading curricula, no positive overall impacts of OCR and mixed impacts for student subgroups were found. Or in other words, a large meta-analysis looked at the thing that popularized one side of this and found it actually might have negative results. One remarkable meta-analysis out of the UK looked at England's own shift in educational policy towards synthetic phonics. Citing England's curriculum as an outlier in its emphasis on phonics, they write, 
our analysis of PISA data suggests that teaching reading in England has been less successful since the introduction of a more emphasis on synthetic phonics, although the correlations reported here require further research. In relation to the national curricula of the regions that we reviewed, there is little evidence that suggests that a synthetic phonics first and foremost orientation to national curricula is likely to be the most effective orientation. So what we're saying is that literacy doesn't come in a box. We're not going to find our kids at the bottom of this curriculum package. And there can't be a broad support for systemic change that excludes teachers implementing these programs in classrooms with students. Reading is part of literacy, but it is not literacy. Just as phonics is part of reading, but that's not just reading. These are necessary things, but they're not sufficient components of this bigger project of literacy. I mean, what is literacy? What is the purpose of literacy? What does it mean to be literate? None of this is an argument against reading, but it's a call for more systemic support for literacy in schools. In a piece titled The Problem with Binaries, a Perspective on the Science of Reading, researchers in the area of literacy write that the science of reading movement leads to an oversimplification of reading, reducing it to a technical exercise. They argue that this oversimplification ignores other important and complicated factors that contribute to how people read, why they read, and how they experience reading instruction, including systemic factors. Things like class sizes, safe and healthy buildings, quality and accessible materials, and well-equipped learning environments, they write, would greatly enhance their ability to care for the whole student and the experiences those students bring individually, culturally, and collectively to schools. Because, of course they do. Jose Luis Vilson, a veteran New York schools educator, also situates curriculum change inside this broader economic and political movement to deprive students and schools in poor communities the opportunities to build literacy. He says, For decades, schools that work with children, particularly children in poverty, have been forced to do more with less. In New York City, that means the mayor has proposed another devastating round of budget cuts to places where students would have more opportunities to develop their reading skills, like schools and libraries. In fact, our libraries, already struggling from consistent cuts over the years, are now closed on Sundays across the city. In addition, the infamous Moms for Liberty has sought to elevate its profile here as well, a boon that's already disrupted schools across the country from teaching children to learn from one another. Ultimately, as we see in the implementation of the new curriculum in New York City schools, the ideological attachment to these evidence-based science of learning methods cannot patch or fix the deeper systemic issues, which lead to just like a scattershot implementation, training, and operations. Just as we wouldn't confuse the paintbrush for the painting or the vehicle for the destination, this idea of doing the science of reading for the sake of it doesn't really seem like a worthy goal. For example, a microscope is an incredibly valuable tool, but it's only one way of seeing one part of a greater whole. It seems obvious to say that there are important questions about cultivating literate kids that a science of reading can help us answer, but there's also many more questions that it cannot. So this discussion about this very narrow science of reading um, narrative slash political slash uh, culture war issue is incredibly important to us because we see the direct effects of a flawed back to basic strategy in school. Back to basics typically means returning to this very rote based systemic uh, memorization style uh, curriculum. At Human Restoration Project, we spend a huge amount of our time conducting focus groups with young people. We start all of our professional development by listening to kids in the system. And time and time again, kids tell us their school day is defined almost entirely by passive teacher-led instruction or in front of a computer completing assignments on Google Classroom or with modules on iWriting. There's a lot of lectures, independent learning, quizzes, worksheets, and those things are fine, but Students almost always tell us that this is like 80 to 90% of any given day. And if you take out electives like music and art, they tell us it's more like 92, even 100% of their day that they're just taking notes, listening to lectures, and doing tests. There are so many situations in so many schools where each day that's all kids are doing in every class. And maybe every now and again, there's a group presentation, maybe once a semester. When we ask young people, what they'd prefer to be doing, they almost always give us the same answer as well. 
They wish about 50% of what they did each day was in groups and in interactive activities, playing games, working on hands-on projects, and being in close cooperation with one another. They want to build a learning community. They want to socialize and be with their friends. They want their teachers to listen and learn from them. And they notice that the teachers who feel that they care about them are also the ones who are pushing for this more collaborative, hands-on approach. When we talk to parents and community members in similar focus groups, they're often surprised to hear about how much work is done independently or through these online modules, and they also want to see more active learning. Usually, we'll have a teacher sit in on our discussions, and they almost always tell us the same thing as well, which is very sad. They say, I wish I could do more about what they're saying, but the standardized testing and district mandates, you know, my hands are tied. If I, as a teacher, don't comply with these mandates, I could be at risk of disciplinary action or even losing my job. Now, in an effort to curb declining reading and math scores, um, or just like general district policy that's associated with the data, teachers are essentially told to deprive children of anything that could be seen as a distraction, any opportunity for play or time to talk with their friends. Ironically, in many ways, it's our obsession with measurement, achievement, and this back-to-basics approach in education that keeps us trapped in this doom loop of constantly measuring, never achieving, and getting stuck on those basics. Of course, we know, just around common sense, but also a lot of research that's out there, that letting students learn from their peers, giving them time to socialize and play, giving them time to work on hands-on projects, all leads to comprehensive understanding that's deeper than retrieval practice ahead of a test. Students may do similar in the short term, but if we look at long-term engagement, motivation, and we just look at a general willingness of wanting to do school, those two methodologies are very different. Short-term retrieval practice might do well on a test, but engagement, motivation, and general curiosity plummets. If we engage in discussions like the reading wars as a narrow model on how we should do school, and we get trapped in the science of reading or back to basics or science of learning approach, that's incredibly dangerous. Because what we're at risk of doing is the common phrase, cut the fluff and teach the stuff. To which we ask, what is the fluff? Is the fluff students working together? Is that giving time for students to work on projects? Is the fluff teaching multiple perspectives on a topic? Is the fluff teaching a book that has LGBTQIA plus characters? Because it seems to us like every single time we talk about back to basics or going back to what the capital science says, what we're really saying is, let's just go back to the days when things weren't complicated. Kids sat in rows, teachers taught, kids were quiet, and everything was simple. Stand and deliver. Instead of having to consider that not all students learn in the same scripted way, or instead of having to talk to students about critical issues, or instead of having to talk about politics or be involved in politics as books and divisive concepts are banned or as students and adult identities are under attack. We see this in the reading wars, the math wars, and now even the, the SEL wars. These wars are going to continue and educators are gonna keep getting played against each other because they're directly tied to political actors seeking to undermine public schools and they're a place for massive corporations to make a ton of money off of whatever new curriculum package is being sold. There's an incentive to literally keeping the wars going as opposed to just talking together. Therefore, these are manufactured proxy wars, the science of learning battle included. It's an unnecessary thing that divides us and distracts us from a real goal, cultivating literate kids who can not just read and write, but engage deeply and critically with the changing world around them. Certainly, we can have disagreements about anything that we've spoken about here today, and we should partner with neuroscientists, developmental psychologists, and of course, educators. Ultimately, the solution to this problem is going to come from deep partnerships in a learning community where we're listening to young people and building an education system where people's needs come before test scores or come before whatever a lab test says in isolation of everything else. In other words, let's just build an education system together as opposed to tearing each other down.